Yeah, hello, my name is Christoph Joy. I am from Austria, Vienna. I am the scientific leader of Research Institute's Digital Human Rights Center, one of the project partners in the Future Cloud project. We have basically the role to watch over data protection in all corners of the project. That means particularly data protection by design and by default. Myself, I am an engineer for communication technology and a lawyer. So one could say I am a kind of interpreter between the two disciplines. Who else within the consortium contributes to privacy-related tasks? Interestingly, in this project, that is kind of a very nature of it, practically everybody because this project is about privacy enhancing technologies. So everybody is involved there. Of course, some of the partners are closer involved. For example, University in Graz about explicable artificial intelligence regarding transparency, for example, or SBA research regarding security by design aspects. The approach is very much about enhancing privacy by creating a real federated machine learning alternative. What are the key challenges biomedical researchers face since the European GDPR took effect in 2018? Well, first of all, I think it is important to understand that GDPR in substance didn't bring so much new rules, that most even of the rules that we find in GDPR had been in force since at least 1995, since the Data Protection Directive. What the big change was that there is a higher threat of punishment for not observing these rules, even in cases where no data breach has taken place. There is more emphasizing on the self-responsibility of controllers of data. So that means there are more explicit duties that have to be fulfilled ahead of the data processing. For example, carrying out the data protection impact assessment. That is something that a controller has to consider from the very earliest moment. And if it's not done, the controller can be punished even though there might not have been yet a data breach. Please briefly explain the terms natural person, personal data, controller and processor. The natural person is the most easy one because that's quite defined. It's everything that is not just a legal construction, but a person. Especially important is you can be data subject regardless of your legal status. A minor that is not yet given the right to take his or her own decisions is still a data subject and a person. Personal data is a tricky term. And also, of course, it is the most important term because if you come to the conclusion that your data is personal, you will have to apply all duties from GDPR. Personal data means any kind of data that is or can be related to a particular natural person. You can have direct or indirect pseudonymized data, and they are distinguished from anonymized data. However, in order to anonymize data as the opposite of personal data, you will have to remove really every feasible possibility to make a connection between the data set you have to conclude from there to a natural person. You have to really think around the corner. So if you want to know if it's personally connected, you have to take into account every feasible step, every step that somebody can do. And therefore, the claim to have something anonymized is a very strong claim, which should be proved with high scrutiny. The controller is actually connected completely with the decisions regarding the processing of data. The controller is who firstly decides upon the purpose or purposes for what data is processed. And the second thing is he decides about the means. Both things are crucial. Of course, the purpose includes the amount of data, which data and all these decisions. The important frontier there is we have on one hand to distinguish the controller from the processor, because a processor is somebody who is processing personal data, but only on behalf of the controller. And that leads to very specific duties according to GDPR. That means you need to conclude a contract with a processor and so on in order to protect data subjects. The other role there could be a so-called joint controller, because as in many parts of this big world, you can take decisions not only alone, but together.
can be that they decide only about aspects of the purpose. Maybe one controller has some overway there and controls 99% of the purpose and so on. So there are many possibilities in reality. It might very well be that one of the players does not even get data or let's say raw data, person related data, but still he has a deciding influence on what is done with the data. Very well explained. Who can be legally held responsible if something goes wrong with the data? The answer to this question shows that GDPR is very much focused on data subjects' rights. Because the interesting answer is everybody is liable in a solidaric way. The data subject might actually by legal means grasp all of them. And that's meant to be. They can fight it out. But GDPR says clearly that's not the problem of the data subject. The data subject is actually entitled to hold all of them liable. Who can a data subject contact for a complaint? And who decides about specific liabilities? That is mainly up to the data protection authority. If subjects go with a complaint to the authority, the authority will scrutinize them all one by one in each of their role. But there is one interesting aspect regarding data subjects' rights. In the constellation of joint controllers, they are all together liable for proper information. They need to make transparent who are the partners and how are these duties shared there. So what is if I want to withdraw something, if I have a complaint, if I use my rights, then I need to know where and with whom and so on. How are these roles assigned in the Feature Cloud Consortium? We have to distinguish. We have to distinguish the phase of the project itself, because right now at the moment, it is actually the University of Hamburg and Professor Baumbach as the project leader being in the role of a controller. And this is because also the legal justification situation throughout the project phase is a different one than it will be if such a system is running. Because then, and this is part of an ongoing research, there will be a joint controllership constellation with different roles also in the feature cloud system. I cannot give all the details yet. Of course, in the end, it shall be a constellation where it is optimized for the viewpoint of data subjects. Can you give examples of famous data leaks or security breaches that violated patient privacy? I really much like to stay in closer history. We find, of course, many examples in older history. One of the very impressive examples in 2019 in Israel, a server that was just not properly configured led to a leak of millions of patient data sets. Altogether, it was 16 million data sets of 50 countries there. It was about DICOM, the Digital Imaging and Communications in Medicine. To take an example from rather a legal perspective, how do you exchange data? If you once have clarified, you can share your data with another institution, you still have the question how you will transport this data. We had quite recently a case now in Italy, where health institutions handed over medical data on a USB stick and there was no proper proceeding, no proper protocol, they got lost and it ended up in a punishment of 100,000 euro from the Italian Data Protection Authority towards the institution. What types of data are especially sensitive with regard to privacy? Actually, all data that are health related are already in this field of being sensitive, particularly the DNA data, because they are so particularly unique. They can't come a second time and they are always a possibility to identify to almost 100% a person, an individual. So that makes them special, but that's a very important part to understand in data protection. You can't simply draw from the kind of data to the level of risk. Something that in the first view might not be considered as a health data can be. I give you a simple example. The website of the Anonymous Alcoholics, AA. What does the website collect? IP addresses. But if this IP address is connectable to a person, and then I see, aha, there is a person that frequently visits the website of AA, and maybe there where the appointments are announced and so on, which kind of conclusions may I be able to draw out of that context? That brings me to the term purpose limitation. Why not use anonymized data in any way needed? If it only would be really anonymized. 
that is, I think, the major point there. So if data is actually really anonymized and this is claimed after all scrutiny, it's okay because then you have actually really no risks anymore. But as soon as you have only pseudonymized data, the purpose limitation is the core aspect of principle because without knowing for what purpose you allow for a fundamental rights interference, it is impossible to foresee what's the impact of it. It is not possible to evaluate if it's proportionate or not. It is also not possible to see what is the appropriate safeguards, checks and balances, whatever to put. Because what means appropriate, that depends, of course, on the impact and on the goal. It is a part of the self-determination that means actually coming out of human dignity, Article 1 of the EU Fundamental Rights Charter. And this is something that has to be preserved. How does the federated approach of Feature Cloud's AI store help protect patient privacy? One, to answer that question, has to understand a root problem. On one hand, these algorithms and machine learning is living and dying from the amount of data available. So if I want to train an algorithm, a computer self-learning algorithm, I need to feed it. The more I have data to feed it, the better I can train it. Now we have the problem that in order to do so, we need to share data. We need to pool data because we have small units on hospital level or whatever, where this data is produced. And in order to make these data lakes, as they are called, big enough to be significant for machine learning, you need to pool them. That's state of play. And that opens up already at this time, when we are not yet talking about using a strong algorithm to save lives, but we are talking about training it in order to see what it can do. And we have there already to share data. And now this is what federated machine learning shall resolve. And I think uh, with good reasons, a technology that allows me to do so without having to exchange the data, without having to pull them together, eliminating all the risks going along that and eliminating most legal challenges coming along with that. I think the contribution of that concept is huge. Back to the hospital, how free is a patient when asked for consent? I think that addresses one of the major problems we have regarding the consent as a tool in medical research. And I think in many setups, the patient is not really so free. I think if you imagine that yourself, when you're in medical treatment, somebody gives you a consent form and you have the feeling if I sign that, they're going to be more motivated to help me, you will sign almost everything, depending on how serious your own situation is. So I think that's to be strongly considered. That's also an ethical impact to be considered. To what extent the person's free will is actually free. And I think that Article 7 GDPR brings new, very strong rules of ensuring that this consent is actually really an informed and a free consent. How can a patient's wish to revoke a previously given consent be implemented? The famous so-called right to be forgotten. This right to be forgotten is a real challenge for every controller, especially if you want or need to share data with others. What we approach in Feature Cloud now is using blockchain technology, something we do in Work Package 6. It is used to give the user much better control over his or her data because the blockchain is a very stable concept and you can use this technology to kind of put your own data on a leash, okay, as data owner, as data subject. And whenever I want, I can pull back that leash and therefore revoke my consent and keep being in control over the so-called informational self-determination. And another part there, is of course also using these technologies by accompanying the controls. That means with what's happening with data, where they are manipulated, if they are deleted or not, and so on. You can have temper-proof protocols, therefore. And the blockchain protocol is a wonderful technology for achieving that. So altogether, it is a puzzle of many pieces where I think Feature Cloud can contribute a lot. What do you enjoy most as a member of the Feature Cloud Consortium? We have often in this kind of projects the role that we are with data protection, rather the ones who are annoying the others and so on. And here is a project environment where everybody is aiming in that direction that brings up working spirit for me and for my team. Feature Cloud.